Let's ask the Lord to fill us with the Holy Spirit to break through any barriers, any veils, so that we can really be open to Him. And we ask through the intercession of our Blessed Mother and St. Joseph, whose feast we need to celebrate. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and in the hour of our death. Amen. I felt to come and not give a lecture, but rather uh, speak from the heart of the sense that we have for these times that we're living. Um, we need to know that our Lord Jesus wants us to be brought into his heart and to participate in his life way beyond what we can imagine. And uh, even if we have a good imagination. <laughs> and so we think, we know that, everyone in this room believes that, and yet, as we yield, we realize even more how amazing God is and how he wants to reveal himself to us. But sometimes we get afraid because it's not the way we think. You know, it's like parents with children. Um, parents told me, tell me that when they care and love their children, um, it doesn't mean to give them what they ask for, but to really pray and discern and give them what you believe is really good for them. And that's the way God is with us. He loves us so much that He takes us through routes that we were not expecting. But through it all, it's really the best for us. And sometimes we say, gee, you know, <coughs> explain this to me. But it's true. And the Lord wants us to know what's going on uh, as much as we need to know. Not everything, but as much as we need to know. And so we need to be aware of the signs of the times. And some people say, well, not, you're not supposed to know that because you don't know the day or the hour, right? You're not supposed to know. However, the Lord said, if you see a cloud rising from the west, you know it's going to rain, and if you see the wind coming from the south, you know it's going to be hot. And then he says, you hypocrites, how come you don't know the signs of the times? So it, you know, just like you can be observant and realize what's going on, with the things of God, he will show us what we need to know because he wants us to be alert and to participate because he loves us so much. Now, an example of this also is in 1 Thessalonians 5, 2. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief at night. When people are saying peace and security, then sudden disaster comes upon them like labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Now, think about that analogy. Any pregnant woman knows that the day is going to come, right? And they can kind of figure out that it's getting closer and closer, right? So it's not like you don't know anything. The Lord is saying it's the same with us. We can see pregnancy. We can experience pregnancy if you're a woman. And you know that you're going to come to the day and you know it's getting closer, but you just don't know exactly when it's going to be. So we need to be seeing the signs of the times and being observant, not to speculate or to fantasize, but to be humbly attentive and be able to respond as the Lord wants. And that has been the way since the beginning, even the Old Testament. And then it goes on to say, First Thessalonians, but you brothers are not in darkness for that day to overtake you like a thief. 
For all of you are children of the light and children of the day. We're not of the night or of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as the rest do, but let us stay alert and sober. Now, last Sunday, we had an amazing event, right? Not only was it Mercy Sunday, but on top of that, we had the canonization of two great popes. That is a sign of the times. Because the Holy Spirit is telling us what John, Paul, John 23 did and what John Paul II did is so significant and so important that I want you to pay attention. So it's pointing again to us of the importance of being online and on board with the Second Vatican Council. Now, the express purpose of John 23rd for opening the council in 1962 was to prepare for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. He asked the whole church to pray so that the windows of the church be open and the wind of the Holy Spirit may come in. What does that mean? First and foremost, it means a profound awakening of the people, of all of us to know the Lordship of Jesus Christ, to enter into a deep and personal relationship with Him. This is the first and foremost work of the Holy Spirit, to graft us into, into Christ Himself so that we think and act and behave as Christ, so that we know Him and love Him, and our whole life is involved with Him with passion, now we have a culture that speaks about a lot of passions, you know, like baseball and football and cars. But the greatest passion of all is the passion of Jesus Christ. He passionately loves us. And He wants to give us the Holy Spirit so that we passionately love Him and one another as well. This is the power of God. And then uh, John Paul II was called by God to reveal the heart of Christ and the heart of God especially through mercy. And if it wasn't for, for him, uh, the whole grace of awareness of divine mercy wouldn't have happened. Because as you know, St. Faustina was kind of blocked from being accepted. But the Lord raised up uh, John Paul II just at the right time. And he canonized her on the year 2000 right to begin this millennium, to let us know this is a time of mercy. This is the grace that I'm bestowing upon you. And last Sunday, this grace was again confirmed to us how important it is for us to enter into this grace of mercy. But also, what the popes have been teaching us about the times takes an extra significance because they're saints now. And we need to get into the teaching and what the saints are, te are, are doing and saying. I was on, on the way over talking to a friend, theologian, and he said, I'm so excited. It's just like John Paul II, especially, because he, we, you know, he's more our contemporary, has come alive for him. And um, he said, you know, he lost his mother when he was about eight or nine years old. He lost his brother, then he lost his father when he was still a teenager. He was left alone in this world, in the middle of this horrific war, uh, and all these bad things happened to him. You know, he would have been a perfect candidate to have a lot of psychological problems, to be a problem child, you know, to need a lot of counseling. And instead, he's teaching and counseling everybody, the whole world. This is really amazing. So I wanted to uh, just remind you of some of the things he said about these times. Um, as Carol Watila, he came to this country in, in Denver, Colorado, in, in 1993, actually as a pope already, in this case, um, and he said, this struggle, the one we're living now, parallels the apocalyptic 
combat described in Revelations 11:19 through 12, 6. Death battles against life. A culture of death seeks to impose itself in our desire to live and live to the full. Vast sectors of society are confused about what is right and what is wrong. This is already in 1993, okay? <laughs> and are at the mercy of those with the power to create opinion and impose it on others. It, in our own century, as in no other time in history, the culture of death has assumed a social and institutional form of legality to justify the most horrible crimes against humanity, genocide, final solutions, ethnic cleansings, and the massive taking of lives of human beings even before they're born or before they reach the natural point of death. The dragon of Revelations 12, the ruler of the world, John 12, 31, and the father of lies, John 8, 44, relentlessly tries to eradicate from human hearts the sense of gratitude and respect for the original and extraordinary and fundamental gift of God, which is human life itself. Today, that struggle has become increasingly direct. Now, it doesn't sound to me like it's life as usual. And this is not an exception to the rule. This is John Paul's second writings. Benedict uh, 16 continued among, uh, in the same line. He often said this critical times we're living, this decisive times we're living, and it's on and on, repeating, something big is happening. This is a great battle. But what happened Sunday, it's just a reminder to us that the Lord is with us, that we should not be afraid. We need to be alert and watchful and completely committed because the battle is great. But if we persevere, we would be on the side of Christ, who is the victor. Now, the Lord needs us, and that's hard for us to, to fathom, that God Almighty, the creator of the universe, needs you and me. He does, because He has given the world to us. He has given us this power for better or for worse. He has brought us redemption. But for the redemption of the world to reach out to all, the Lord wants to do it through us. We are His body for real. And so we need to let the Lord empower us, fill us with the Holy Spirit so that we can continue His work on earth. That's exactly what St. Faustina did. I don't think it makes any sense to say, oh, I love St. Faustina, or I love John Paul II, or Maximilian Kolbe, or any of the modern saints, if we have no intention of learning from them and imitating them, and getting to know how they engaged in this battle so dramatically, so full-heartedly. You see, all of us, we have the tendency of Perceiving God as the great benefactor. You know, if you have a, an organization, and it's a good organization, you want benefactors, and if they give you enough money, you're willing to even make some arrangements. And, okay, we'll, we'll listen to you, and we'll show you the plans so you know the good things we're doing, and we will be willing to have some guidelines, etc. But we don't want the benefactor to take over, do we? And deep inside, our problem is that we're afraid of God. This is what we inherited from Adam and Eve. We are afraid of God. And so, 
we love him, we want to be good, we want to keep the commandments, uh, we're willing to dialogue with him and so on, but we're really afraid to say, Lord, I give you my life completely. Do whatever you want. Because somehow we think that if we do that, he's going to squash us or something terrible is going to happen to us. And we need to go there to the root of that and ask, Lord, I want to go there with you, with Jesus, and discover that fear and acknowledge it and allow the Lord to heal us. A perfect example of that is the rich man who goes to Jesus and it's living by the law. That's the Old Testament, right? And he's a good man. From youth, he has followed the commandments. You know, remember? He do, he's done everything pretty good. He's willing to dialogue with God and keep it within the parameters and be okay and go to heaven. But then the Lord looks at him with love and he's very happy to hear that he's done all these good things. That's necessary. That's good. But that's not the New Testament. So he tells him, now go, give it all up, and follow me. Do you realize the Lord is inviting him to be one with him? And he's so concerned about what he's giving up. But the apostles understood the challenge, and they got scared. Lord, it's hard to give up everything. It's hard to trust you that much. And Jesus says, yeah, it is. Matter of fact, it's not possible for you guys. But nothing is impossible for God. So what he's saying, you just need to learn to trust me, to plunge into my arms and let go. And I will care for you. How far? All the way. You see, this is radical marriage. Nothing less. The Lord wants to marry us. In marriage, you don't say, okay, let's make a deal, you know, of goods. Both parties are giving themselves completely forever. And how is it that we're able to do this with a creature and we have such a hard time doing it with God. You say, I, all yours, in good times, in bad times, in richness and in health, whatever. I love you, I trust you, I just plunge into your arms. And when that happens, and we can go deeper and deeper as the Holy Spirit is stronger and stronger in us, we will find fulfillment and happiness. But our beloved, is in a great adventure, a great drama, because we are in a battle. And he will bring us with him into the battle. The whole transformation is from being basically self-reliant and trying to appease God or do good enough to be okay with God, the transformation into total surrender and allowing God to reign over your opinions, your attitudes, your perspectives, everything. It's a lifelong journey. Oftentimes we say, well, this is my spirituality. Have you checked with God? Or you just made it up? This is my, this is the way I am. This is my spirituality. This is what I like. This is what I don't like. This is the gifts I want to have. This is the gifts I don't want to have. Well, who's in control here? And God wants to reign sovereignly and take you whatever He wants to, but you have already decided what is your spirituality. And I don't think that works. Nobody 
can impose a spirituality on you, but if you marry God, then you have to let Him impose it on you lovingly. He won't unless you let Him. And He will show you things that maybe you would have never thought you wanted in your life because He's God and He's in control. It's amazing how, you know, even in the Catholic Church, we, on the plane coming from Colombia, I was sitting next to this lady, and uh, she's telling me if priests should marry or not marry, and this and that. I'm sitting there, you know, where, where are all these opinions coming from? Have you checked with God if that's what He wants? You know, I have enough trouble trying to be faithful to be able to run the whole church by myself and decide how everything should be. I'd rather let the Holy Spirit do that and just be humble and, and believe. So St. Faustina gave us a description of what is a person that lives mercy. And it's really like Jesus, you know. Jesus, when he speaks about the way, he's really opening his heart. For example, when Jesus speaks about the Beatitudes, he's showing his heart. He is the blessed one. He is the poor in spirit. He is the merciful one. He is the meek. So it's like show and tell. He tells us, and then he lifts it in front of us so that we understand what he's saying. And the same thing with the saints and St. Faustina. Uh, the Lord gave her, gave her the diary, and it's, you read it, but then when you read her, Life, it's coming to life. And uh, this year, I was, I was doing the novena of, you know, Divine Mercy, and when it came to the seventh day, I was amazed. Because it's right there. This is what it's to be, a person that is intimate with God and is living in Divine Mercy. Listen. Today, bring to me the souls who specially venerate and glorify my mercy. Isn't that what you want to do? To be a person that specially venerates and glorifies my mercy. That's what Jesus wants of all of us to be. Now, this is the description. These souls sorrowed most over my passion and entered most deeply into my spirit. They are living images of my compassionate heart. Doesn't that make sense? You know what he's saying? This sons and daughters really love me. They sorrowed with me. They felt my battle. They were one with me. In good times and in bad times, when Jesus sorrows to see the brokenness of marriages, the brokenness of children, the brokenness of the world, we who are one with Him, we sorrow with Him. We live His interior martyrdom with Him because that's the way love is. The greatest suffering is not physical. The mystics say that as horrific as the tortures that Jesus physically went through, like the thorns and the nails and the beatings, much greater was his interior suffering that he carried all through his life because he loves us. Now, to give you a graphic understanding of this, think that you have an accident and you hit your face with a steering wheel and you get a, a purple eye, whatever, black eye, and, and you get hurt. And think that the exact same uh, degree of blow came from you, but this time <clears throat> from your husband or your wife. The same physical damage, but what's the difference? The difference is that one was an accident, doesn't really mean anything, but the other one is going to hurt so much because it was 
a betrayal of love of the person that should love you the most in this world. The sufferings of Christ are being uh, hid by things is nothing compared to the suffering of the betrayals that we, okay, that we do against Him, the suffering of His heart. And when we get into that, we enter into love. You can't separate love and suffering. As a matter of fact, a lot of people can't love because they're so afraid of suffering. And if you're not willing to suffer for the beloved, you just cannot love. It's not that we're looking for suffering. We're looking for being sensible and loving. Doesn't that, doesn't that make sense? I always ask this to, to parents. Um, what do you rather have? Um, your arm cut off or your son's or daughter's arm cut off? And then, you know, all the parents say, you know, you cut my arm first. And I say, why? I mean, if you cut your, your son's or daughter's arm, it's not going to hurt you. And all parents agree, you'll hurt me even more. Right? Isn't that amazing? That's love. We are truly the mystical body of Christ. As the Holy Spirit takes over more and more in our lives, we suffer everything with Christ and we rejoice everything with Christ. We are passionately one. And we should not be afraid of it. See, we, were, we grew up in a culture where the maxim is to avoid suffering, right? The whole basis of publicity is based on that. Avoid suffering, maximize pleasure. Christ reveals to us the love of God. And the love of God is so great that now is the new maxim. And for love of God, we're willing to suffer. We're willing to give up pleasures, whatever it takes. That's what Jesus did. Now, suffering did not come from God. It came from the breakdown because of sin. And we were all doomed. We were all lost. Now, from all eternity, the Father pours Himself in love to the Son. So much so that the Father is in the Son. And the Son loves so perfectly that He returns Himself and gives Himself completely to the Father. It's the absolute divine love affair. This love is so amazing, so perfect, that it's a person. It's the Holy Spirit. And we were created to be grafted into Christ, to be so much one with Him that we are actually receiving the, the love of the Father and with Christ, in Christ, giving ourselves to the Father in this amazing, infinite love affair. But that got ruined because of sin. We, we broke that relationship. So what happened? There was like a coup d'etat. Our soul that was created to be filled with God, finding itself empty and with the manipulation of Satan, began to crave for just pleasure, to fill itself with something. And so our bodies and all of creation, which is perfectly beautiful in God's perfect plan, began to dominate our soul instead of our body being an expression of the soul. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. They're beautiful. They're holy unto God. And they have a purpose, our bodies, is to express the love of God with all our being, all our senses. Now they became kind of uh, oppressed and we got into this great bondage. So what did God do? He loved us so much, He sends us His only Son, and Jesus truly becomes a man like us. Truly. And He continues to do what He has been doing for all eternity, which is what? Receive all the love of the Father 
and give the Father all the love and live passionately this love affair as a man. And the fury of Satan came upon him. So how did he save us? Why is the cross our salvation? It's not because of what they did to, to Jesus. That's evil. That's a crime. What saves us is the love by which Jesus Christ committed himself to the Father and to us that is so powerful, so strong, that not even the worst fury of Satan could overcome it. He chose to love to the end. And it is the power of love, the power of love lived from a human heart. That's what saves us, because he is also God. But in Gethsemane, Jesus had to struggle because he's really human, and his human will recoiled at this barrage of evil coming at him. And he said, may this chalice pass from me. But then he said, but your will be done and not mine. That's where he saves us. Is that decision to overcome what Adam had done. Adam had said, my will, not God's will. Now Jesus comes and says, your will, Father, not my will. And it's that that brings us an opening, in the br a breach in the wall, so that as we enter into that yes, into that love, as we partake and we become lovers with him, we enter into this battle, we are saved, we are redeemed, and we become redeemers for others as well because we become one with Christ. It is the power of love, a love that doesn't stop when all the bad comes against it, that is our salvation. And so why do we exalt the cross? Because we remember that not even that much evil could stop Jesus from loving us. He conquered the cross. And the cross has become a sign of victory, a sign of how much he loves us. It's like if, um, if your son um, was faithful uh, and he was shot in a firing squad and you carried a bullet around, you know, why do you carry that bullet? To remind you that not even that would stop your son from loving and being faithful. That's how great his love is. That's why St. Paul says, I preach Jesus and Jesus crucified. Because it's this amazing love that is the driving force of every saint. So God is not just a benefactor. God is our love who wants to draw us so much into himself that we enter into this dynamic love of Jesus with the Father and with all of us. So redemption is not just a legal transaction. You know, somebody did bad, then somebody had to pay for it. So Jesus Christ came and paid for it. It's much more than that. We destroy the relationship and Jesus Christ came to bring it back together with his act of love and give us the Holy Spirit so that we can partake of this act of love and graft us all into himself. And that is what happens in baptism. The baptism is only the beginning. We then need to live it through our lives. In our community retreat, uh, the husband of one of, of the women, Jennifer, uh, he, his name is Tom, he, uh, he works with um, bioengineering. And he heard me speaking all the time about uh, grafting, and that's what he 
what he does. And he said to all of us, you know, in grafting, the critical point is for the blood vessels to be able to be well connected so that immediately the blood goes into the grafted uh, tissue because if that tissue doesn't receive right away a flow of blood, he's going to die, corrupt and die. Isn't that amazing? The Eucharist. We're grafted into Christ, but if the blood doesn't flow, if we're not constantly connected, the tissue is going to die. And then another sister in the community says, I just had a graft done in my mouth. And for weeks, it's been very, very difficult. My mouth got big and, you know, very uncomfortable until I learn to live with it. So we're grafted into Christ and we have to struggle to stay there because the flesh is still rebellious and we have to put to death the rebelliousness of the flesh and learn and receive the power from the blood of Jesus to be able to die to the old self and to be born to a new life. It's not then just keeping commandments and observing laws. That, of course, is necessary, but the amazing reality of Jesus Christ is that he gives us himself so that we live a truly a new life. Now, remember Nicodemus? He couldn't understand this. He said, how can you be born again? Well, Jesus tries to explain, but Nicodemus was not ready yet. So what did Jesus say to him? Well, just like Moses lifted up the serpent. When I am lifted up, then you'll know. So if we have a difficulty being born again, what are we supposed to do? Look at his love. Gaze upon the cross. Just see what he's done for us. Ponder his love. Ponder how far his love goes. And the Holy Spirit comes upon us. But that's a discipline of life. We need to go to the cross. Kiss his feet. Over and over again. Say, Lord, you love me so much. That's a motor, that's the power that drove the life of all the saints. For example, St. Paul says, he loved me and he gave his life for me. He loved me. He'll do anything for me. He will suffer for me. There's nothing he will not do for me. Wow. Well, that's the experience of St. Paul. That's the power that drives his life. And then he has shipwrecks, beatings. Um, he's stoned to death, left like dead, betrayed by everybody, and finally uh, beheaded. Nothing could stop him. He didn't whine and say, oh, gee, you know, look, another shipwreck, you know. This is not fair. God doesn't love me. Why is it so hard? Hey, he was living madly in love with Jesus. And everything, every circumstance was an opportunity to say, Lord, I love you too. So let's go back to divine mercy, the seventh day. Remember, Jesus is now telling St. Faustina who are the ones who are living in his mercy. Okay? And he says, these souls sorrowed most over my passion and entered most deeply into my spirit. They are living images of my compassionate heart. These souls will shine with a special brightness in the next life. Not one of them will go into the fire of hell. I shall particularly defend each one of them at the hour of death. And then this is a prayer inspired by Jesus. Most merciful Jesus, whose heart is love itself. Receive into the abode of your most compassionate heart the souls of those who particularly extol and venerate the greatness of your mercy. And now again a description of who they are. 
These souls are mighty with the very power of God Himself. In the midst of all afflictions and adversities, they go forward, confident of your mercy and united to you. O oh, Jesus, they carry all mankind on their shoulders. These souls will not be judged severely, but your mercy will embrace them as they depart from this life. These souls are living a living gospel. Their hands are full of deeds of mercy and their hearts overflowing with joy. Sing a canticle of mercy to you, O Most High. Now the official commentary says this about these souls. The text leads one to conclude that Jesus, who is the Redeemer, uh, that these are victim souls and contemplatives that are being prayed for. These persons, that is, voluntarily offer themselves to God for the salvation of their neighbors. These, this explains their close union with the Savior and the extraordinary efficacy that their invisible activity has for others. Invisible activity? That means when these souls are washing dishes, cleaning the floor of their house, doing everything for love of Jesus, one with Him, surrendering completely to Him, the Lord is so pleased. It's like Nazareth. They are redeeming the world. They're saving souls. They're partaking in redemption by lovingly living and doing all the hidden things. It's amazing. It's, it's the seventh day. So I will suggest to you that you look forward to being Christians of the seventh day of the novena. Not seven days, <laughs> the sect. <laughs> Further, St. Faustina says in her diary, number 726, I desire to be completely transformed in love. No, I'm sorry, this is Jesus telling her, I desire for you to be completely transformed in love and that you burn with the fire of a victim of pure love. And of course, St. Faustina offered herself as a victim of love. In fact, she explicitly uh, wrote her offering as a victim of love in the diary, and she says, I renew it every day in the chaplet. When she talks about blood, the blood and water at the end, she is uniting her life, her sorrows, her happiness, everything. And she was not doing anything extraordinary, right? She was a porter, and she worked in the kitchen, and she was joining everything, joining with the blood and water of the heart of Jesus and offering herself to the Father. Now, what does that remind you of? The chaplet. Can you see? The chaplet is a continuation of the Eucharist. That's what we do at Mass every time we go to Mass. We go to Mass to join Jesus Christ, our beloved, in His total offering to the Father in a love sacrifice. And we will never understand fully the Mass unless we go to Mass to die and to be born again by entering into the sacrifice. Saying, Jesus, you and I are no longer two, but one in your sacrifice of love. Where the head is, the body is two, or one. For better or for worse, for good or for bad. If he's offended, I'm offended. If he's insulted, I'll be insulted. When he's persecuted, I'm persecuted. But he rose glorious and triumphant, so will I. We are one. And this is what the Lord is preparing us. There is a prophetic consensus from the popes, from so many saints, that the church is going to Calvary, that the church is going to great trials. But there will be glorious times for the church. 
I wish we had more time because there's so much of it from the Holy Fathers, from, from even people that they beatified. In 2011, Benedict XVI beatified Elena Aiello. You read her writings, it's totally amazing. She's uh, very prophetic about the times we're entering, uh, and she says it very explicitly. Why did the Pope beatify her in 2011? And then you read Fatima, you read Akita, on and on, and we don't need to know the day or the hour. We don't need to, to know what doesn't concern us. We just need to know that we have to be with him, that we have to be ready, that we have to love him with all our heart, mind, and soul that we have to be brave to say, my beloved Jesus, I'm here for you. I'm here with you. And if we believe that, the way we are going to um, view going to Mass and going to the Blessed Sacrament in adoration, I'm not going to any longer say, oh, my gee, you know, I'm tired, I don't have time. You know. uh, we have to know this is a, a militant church. And... Um, like every love affair, we have to protect it. And we have to be willing to persevere when we don't feel anything. As a matter of fact, it's your day for, holy, for the holy hour. You feel absolutely nothing. You're really tired. You're really bored. You don't want to go. You say, Jesus, my body is not cooperating, but I love you, and I'm going. That's the day that it counts the most. Just the same with your spouse. Your spouse is on a business trip, and he's far away, and he's having temptations, and he says, Jesus, I love my wife, I love my husband, I'm faithful, and I'm thinking of her. That's when he's showing the most love. So, Luke 12, 49. I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and what stress I am under until it is completed. Jesus is looking forward to the crucifixion. I'm stressed until it's completed because I want to give my life to my wife, who is the church. And this is my baptism in which I'm to be baptized. And I'm doing all this because I want to set all my beloved on fire. And that's what he told St. Faustina. I want you to burn as a victim of love. Don't we? To say, Lord, you came to set the world on fire. It's definitely not on fire very much. But at least I want to be on fire for you. Like Jesus said to St. Margaret, remember? Behold the heart. She saw his heart who so loves the world and only receives indifference and contempt. At least you love me. And this is what it's all about. We have to refocus from ourselves, trying to be good and trying to comply, to enter into this passion of love and focus and center in the Lord, in the heart of Jesus. If you want to know another example, we just celebrate the Feast of St. Catherine of Siena one of my favorites. Just a little glimpse of what she wrote about this. Eternal God, eternal Trinity, you have made the blood of Christ so precious through his sharing in your divine nature. You are a mystery as deep as the sea. The more I search, the more I find. The more I find, the more I search for you. But I can never be satisfied. What I receive will ever leave me desiring more. When you fill my soul, I have an ever greater hunger, and I grow more famished for your light. I desire above all to see you true light as you really are. I have tasted and seen the depth of your mystery and the beauty of your creation with the light of my understanding. I have clothed myself with your likeness and have seen what I shall be. Eternal Father, you have given me a share in your power and the wisdom that Christ claims as his own. And your Holy Spirit has given me the desire to love you. On and on she goes about being on fire with the Lord. 
And uh, this is what God wants for all of us. He, one of the bad, dangerous temptations of the devil is that we used to think that saints were like a quota, you know, two or three per century at the most. So, you know, it will be presumptuous to think that I could be a saint, right? Now, the Second Vatican Council tells me and tells all of us, we are all called to be saints. And God will be disappointed if you're not. God, with all his power and might, is on your side and my side for us to be saints. If we just let him, he will make us saints. Most hidden, most will not be canonized. It doesn't matter, but real saints. The fact is that modern saints were called by the Holy Spirit to offer themselves as victims of love. John Paul II did, Maximilian Kolbe uh, did, St. Faustina did, Padre Pio did, uh, St. Teresa of Lisieux did, and so on. St. Teresa of Lisieux said, for example, she saw a legion of little souls, victims of merciful love, will become as numerous as the stars of heaven and the sands of the seashore. It will be terrible for Satan. It will help the Blessed Virgin to crush his proud head completely. God is preparing these um, victims of love. What does that mean? Because the word victim you know, terrifies us because we think of, in terms of modern culture. What it means is Jesus, who became the Lamb of Sacrifice, who offered himself, saying, Lord, I'm totus tuus, all yours. That's what it means. It's making of my life a complete offering of love to the Lord. It's really what St. Paul says in Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I that live, but Christ living in me. And that life which I now live in the flesh, I live in faith. The faith which is in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. We will not be able to overcome addictions. And I'll dare say that many, many, many people in our culture have addictions today, especially in the area of sexuality. And we think, you know, it can't, I can't get rid of this. Of course we can. But we have to gaze upon Jesus crucified so much and, and be so committed to turn to him that our whole mind is enlightened and transformed through his presence. It's not like, oh, I'm going to try. That's not going to work. Or I'm going to try to fight with the devil. We're going to lose that way. But if we turn to the Lord and, and we commit ourselves to enter into the love of the cross, the power of Jesus will draw us and we will realize that, like St. Paul says, what I'm giving up is garbage compared to what God is giving me. It's like if you have your house and your, and your money in the bank and your car, and they tell you, would you give it all up? Uh, you probably would not. But if they tell you this five acres of land, are, there's a deep oil well there, billions of dollars. Nobody knows yet. You can buy it. Right that, like that. You sell your car, you get all the money from your bank, you sell your house, everything, and all of a sudden, all of, all of it seems like nothing because you're looking forward to this field that is going to yield millions of dollars, right? Unless we focus and be attentive to Jesus Christ and say, I am going to put my heart, mind, and soul disciplined into pondering his love. We, and this is not psycho psychology, this is not mind control, this is not a technique, this is an encounter with the living God. You see, faith is not something just intellectual. Faith is an encounter with the living God that involves the will, the intellect, and the emotions. That's what Benedict XVI said, remember? 
And uh, Pope Francis actually repeated, he said, I love that explanation, Pope Francis has said. This comes from Benedict XVI. Uh, it doesn't mean that you feel the emotions all the time. What it means is that you're surrendering your emotions as well and your affectivity to the Lord. That you're giving it to Him. And you know something? If you're in a dark night of the soul and you're feeling nothing, that definitely counts because you're longing to find Him again. You're orienting your whole being towards the encounter. It's not enough to say, yeah, I believe in God. Yeah, I believe in three persons and I believe everything. Where is your heart? Where is your passion, your affectivity? What's really driving your life? 